23rd of January, 2017. Liberty Media formally acquires F1 for $4.4 billion, ending a four-decade-long ownership where one man had been the star of the show, where one man had saved the sport from sinking out of existence. And yet, what it had taken that man to get there was nothing short of a Christopher Nolan movie. During his time, the sport had been anything but boring. Rivals held at gunpoint, war with the FIA, and even shady dealings with governments. This is the story of Bernie Eccleston and how he changed Formula One forever. Bernie Eccleston was a man who loved racing, but in 1951, he took a break after an accident where he collided with Bill Whitehouse and was thrown from the cockpit into the car park. During this time, he got into real estate investments while keeping an eye on the profitable car business. Eccleston returned to racing in 1957, this time as the manager of driver Stuart Lewis Evans. He even bought two chassis from the disbanded Connaught F1 team. Eccleston's managerial role continued as Stuart Lewis Evans moved to the Van Wall team until tragedy struck at the 1958 Moroccan Grand Prix. Lewis's engine exploded, causing severe burns, and six days later, he passed away. This was a big blow for Bernie. He had been really close to Lewis and doubted if he would even continue in the sport after an event like that. But the world stopped for no one, and whilst Bernie was shaken on an individual level, he continued. At the same time, the entire sport had begun to struggle collectively in the 1960s. Actually, struggle is an understatement. Teams were diving deeper into research, development and cutting-edge technologies, pushing the financial boundaries of the sport. The quest for speed and innovation came at a price, and only those with boatloads of money could afford to stay at the forefront of competition. Adding to the financial tightrope was the sport's reliance on manufacturers. Many teams leaned heavily on support from automotive giants. While this partnership brought technological advancements and performance boosts, withdrawals or financial troubles on the part of manufacturers could leave associated teams hanging by a thread. Unlike the global spectacle it is today, the 1960s F1 had yet to fully embrace the potential of television and global sponsorships as major revenue streams. Teams found it challenging to secure stable financial backing beyond traditional sources. As a result, Formula One suffered. People didn't know if it was going to survive. Things weren't exactly ideal on track either. Safety concerns were a big worry in the sports during this time. In the 1960s, there were tragic accidents, and famous drivers like Wolfgang von Trips and Jim Clark lost their lives. And despite the heartbreaking Lewis incident, Eccleston stayed active in the racing world, managing Jochen Rint and partially owning Rint's 1970 Lotus Formula 2 team. However, tragedy struck Bernie once again as Rint lost his life in a crash at the Monza circuit on his way to the 1970 World Championship. Although Rint was posthumously awarded the championship, it was a bittersweet moment for Eccleston. The oil crisis was one of the sparks that set off a global recession in the 1970s recession. When the recession hit, it exposed the deep-seated problems in UK manufacturing, making the road to recovery much slower. To complicate matters, the UK's government tried some not-so-smooth moves to control wage increases, attempting to keep Keep them below inflation, and this only set off an avalanche of unpleasant consequences as industries soared, factories shut down, staff were laid off, and companies started cutting down on sponsorship budgets. After years of watching from the sidelines, Bernie had realised there was a real need for team advocacy in the sport. They just weren't valued enough. F1 needed a revolution, and he was going to bring it. A revolution that started the day he purchased Brabham Racing from Ron Torrance for £100,000 in 1971. What followed was something out of a thriller movie. Bernie was good at his job. Brabham were visibly on the up and up, and many wondered if it was because he'd signed Gordon Murray as chief designer, or if it was because Nelson Piquet and Nicky Lauda were the ones pulling their boat along. But let me just tell you this right now. What Bernie brought to the table Heck, Bernie was the table with the way he ran the show. His attention to detail, focusing on small victories to achieve big successes, was evident in the way his team stood out on the track. Brabham, with their sharp attention to detail and pursuit of perfection, were a trendsetter. Think about mechanics wearing colour-coded uniforms, a really cool idea for that time. This dedication to precision not only created a strict schedule, but also guaranteed their entry into the racing scene. As the sport became more popular, exposure and income increased, and of course, Bernie Eccleston made sure he got his share of the financial pie. While Eccleston might have received some help along the way, it was undoubtedly his sharp vision that shaped the future of Brabham and F1. I don't think anyone could match Eccleston's unique combination of style, 
boldness, cheek, and determination. Even though the racing itself could have been better, Bernie played his off-track moves perfectly. In 1974, the Formula One Constructors Association was established, and in 1978, Bernie Eccleston became the chief executive of the Formula One Constructors Association, with the legal expertise of Max Mosley. On the surface, they seemed like an odd pair, and yet their partnership would go on to become a nightmare for their opponents. With these appointments, the page turned to a new chapter in the sports story, one full of heart-pumping racing, a war off track, and even the FIA's president being threatened by armed guards. The new position really, really suited Mosley and Eccleston. Mosley reveled in the political arena, while Eccleston saw significant business potential. They were disrupting the status quo, a status quo that had been leeching off the sport. Eccleston knew that there was money to be found in the sport. Could he even find it when nobody else had thought past earnings from tickets and race promoters? The answer is yes. Bernie Eccleston was a man who always found a way. He had recognized that the sport had the potential to be a spectacle. Who wouldn't want to watch athletes driving on the edge, giving it everything on the track? Yes, the race promoters had paid good money, but it was not enough. He bypassed them and went straight to the world of television. This was a masterstroke of genius. Not only would Formula One now earn from TV rights deals, it would earn from sponsorships, because the sport now had a lot of eyeballs on it. And you know what they say about eyeballs? Where there are eyeballs, hungry capitalists will be there. And so brands started jumping on board. With one maneuver, Eccleston had checkmated everyone. The race promoters lost their bargaining power. The world of television needed him because people wanted to watch F1, and the teams knew who was bringing in the money for them. The man had assumed a real position of power. Previously, broadcasters had the liberty to selectively cover races, believing they deserved compensation for promoting the events. Eccleston, however, with TV rights deals, turned the tables on them. So you have a plan B ready to put into effect. I don't know anything about it, sorry. <laughs> By convincing them to sign annual contracts covering every race, with a substantial fee Attached. And you know what the most shocking thing is? This was all Bernie. None of these incredibly decisive moves had involved the FISA. Eccleston was accumulating power from the shadows, and fast. The sporting arm of the FIA, the global governing body of motoring, perhaps surprisingly continued to maintain a low profile. They were content in the knowledge that someone else was handling the legwork in promoting the sport, for which they were clearly responsible. But they had not realized that the FOCA, the British bloc, and Bernie Eccleston had now become incredibly powerful. The Englishman was on the up and up until he met his match in 1978, when FISA elected a new president. Jean-Marie Balestri, a flamboyant businessman determined to reclaim power from FOCA and the predominantly British teams. And so the stage was set for a war between two individuals willing to go to any length to gain control. The FOCA had originally been established to advocate for British teams, and it recognized the need for collective strength to counterbalance the formidable influence of teams like Ferrari. The FIA, led by President Jean-Marie Balestri, though, had now arrived on the scene to be a thorn in Eccleston's side. Balestri had a penchant for extravagance, often indulging in Rolls Royces and presidential suites at the expense of the FIA, and this irritated Eccleston. It did not help that European bias was becoming increasingly obvious in Balestri's decisions to Eccleston. The tension only grew, and this laid the groundwork for the infamous FISA-FOCA war, a high-stakes conflict where winning meant survival. Bernie Eccleston often and risked personal funds and tirelessly rallied British teams to his cause. His tactics ranged from threatening race boycotts to a dramatic episode where armed guards held Balestri at gunpoint in Spain. Yes, it really went that far. Balestri's pride became a pivotal tool for Eccleston, who often used it to his advantage. Threatening to boycott races in France, Eccleston would strategically apply pressure, knowing that Balestri's discomfort in front of his home country would mean that the president would comply, even if only for a single race. So when Jean-Marie Balestri attempted to sway other British team owners to his side, Eccleston responded with incredible speed. He swiftly reached out to these owners and got them back on board. He was incredible at gaming the system in public, and he was even more dangerous when there weren't any cameras rolling. One particularly intriguing episode unfolded when Mosley and Eccleston once checked into the same hotel as the FIA president at a critical stage in the war. Guess what they did? I'll give you five seconds. You can also subscribe in the meantime. The two tracked Balestri's calls, discovering that he was talking with Lotus boss Colin Chapman. This, though, was a problem. Bernie knew that Chapman could persuade the other British owners to support Balestri, so he had to act quickly. Eccleston swiftly summoned Chapman and persuaded him to stay on his side, appealing to his vanity by complimenting his design talent. Needless to say, it worked. 100%, yes. The use of such tactics, though, was not uncommon on either side, and Eccleston had a simple mantra. Act now, 
threaten later. Eccleston's toolkit went beyond just negotiation skills. His personal connections with tracks and the governments of host countries played a crucial role. His friendship with King Juan Carlos gave him the authority to take control of the circuit from Balestri during the 1980 Jarama Grand Prix in Spain. That, to me, is crazy. Volker have informed that after a night of negotiations, Royal Automobile Club of Spain has informed the visa that the Spanish Grand Prix is not to run under the auspices of the visa and the presence of visa officials is no longer required at your army. When it came to strategic bluffing, Eccleston had a certain finesse. During the South Africa Grand Prix in Kalami, Belestri declared that the race would not count towards the championship. Undeterred, Eccleston encouraged teams to participate, even covering costs and providing his own tyres when sponsor Goodyear refused. Though a risky move, this showed how determined Eccleston was to win. And win he did when he gained the confidence and support of Enzo Ferrari. The FOCA now had its biggest rival on its side. L'assenza di Balestra ha un significato. L'assenza, ma non era invitato. Balestri was furious. Bernie Eccleston had won the battles and the war. The victory took the form of the Concord Agreement, a very famous agreement that reshaped the dynamics of Formula One. The lasting impact of the Concord Agreement showed in Eccleston and Mosley securing positions on the FIA committee. This strategic move allowed them to lead the significant growth of Formula One's commercial aspects in the late 1980s. While the FIA kept control over rules and regulations, Eccleston played a central role in managing the commercial side of Formula One. By 1987, Eccleston was the big player in the sport, thriving in his politics. It's when he felt he was at his strongest. The same year, his influence expanded further as he sold Brabham for a staggering $5 million and took the role of Vice President of Promotional Affairs at FISA. He orchestrated the formation of the Formula One Promotional Association, FOPA, later known as Formula One Management, FOM, to oversee TV rights. Under the FOPA umbrella, a real shift occurred. The new system proved significantly more profitable, allocating 47% of TV revenues to the teams, 30% to the FIA, and retaining 23% for the FOPA. As the years rolled on, Max Mosley ascended to the presidency of the FIA. <coughs> The president of the ESA, Mr. Max <laughs> And former Brabham staff assumed pivotal roles within the organization. Eccleston found himself surrounded by familiar faces, and the success of FOPA and Formula One continued its meteoric ascent. In 1995, Max Mosley's FIA bestowed upon Bernie Eccleston the commercial rights of F1 for a staggering 15-year duration. Yes, the rights to a whole sport being granted to one man. It was a coronation of sorts, an acknowledgement of Eccleston's unparalleled influence over the sport's destiny. Yet, Bernie was far from finished. He held an ace card yet to be revealed. In 1996, he orchestrated a strategic move by transferring the ownership of his Formula One empire to his wife, Slavica. This maneuver served both tax considerations and as part of the intricate preparations for the impending flotation of the company in 1997. The reins of Formula One management and its subsidiaries now rested in the hands of Slick Holdings, humorously presumed to stand for Slavica Eccleston. McLaren, Williams, and Tyrrell initially resisted signing a new Concord agreement. Eventually, through negotiations and discussions, the teams were persuaded to sign a 10-year deal, while a robust 15-year agreement was inked with the FIA. And it wasn't just the landscape of Formula One that was marked by corporate maneuvers. Eccleston also thrust himself into national headlines with a £1 million donation to the Labour Party. The street is still refusing to disclose how much money it received from the head of motor racing. £1 million, sir, I'm sorry. <laughs> do, do, do you give a donation expecting something in return? No, I didn't want anything. This coincided with F1 lobbying the government to circumvent a European directive and permit tobacco sponsorship. Tony Blair would later issue an apology for the mishandling of the situation, and the donation was returned following the parliamentary standards watchdog's advice. In 1999, Eccleston executed another financial move, selling 12.5% of SLEC to the venture capitalist firm Morgan Grenfell Private Equity for a staggering $325 million. Around the same time, Eccleston underwent heart surgery and a triple coronary bypass, 
Remarkably, he swiftly returned to work in robust health. The savvy negotiator then orchestrated a groundbreaking deal that granted him the commercial rights of F1 for an astonishing 100 years. Yep, 100 years. I'm not kidding. A significant lump sum of $60 million from the deal financed the construction of new FIA offices in Paris. Eccleston's financial chessboard then saw further moves as he sold 37.5% of SLEC to the US-based investment company Hellman & Friedman for an eye-watering $725.5 million. This entity was then sold to Thomas Haffer of the German media company EMTV for an astonishing $1.65 billion in cash and company shares. Well, you flopped off half of Formula One, but you're still sort of cruising around it like you own the place still. My wife sold, or the trust sold half, not me. I've got nothing. I'm just a poor guy trying to work. When Bernie Eccleston originally set his sights on taking control of Formula One, the sport was essentially a realm of amateurs. Each country had the freedom to negotiate broadcasting rights, manage income from sponsorships, and trackside advertising, while also paying out starting and prize money to the racers. However, Eccleston revolutionized this setup, recognizing the pivotal role of television in the sport's future. He secured exclusive rights to negotiate broadcasting fees, organize sponsorships, and collect proceeds from trackside advertising. Suddenly, individual race promoters found their financial landscape turned upside down. Not only were gate receipts their sole income source, but they were also required to pay Eccleston substantial fees. Monaco was the exception, escaping the fee burden due to its status as an annual sponsor magnet. As some of the less glamorous European races faced financial challenges under the new arrangement, Eccleston displayed a ruthless sight. Iconic tracks like Imola vanished from the race calendar, and so did the French Grand Prix, despite its century-old history. Even the historic Silverstone, hosting the first round of the inaugural World Championship in 1950, faced continuous threats from Eccleston. Eccleston successfully brought Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, Turkey, Malaysia, China, India, and later Russia into the Formula One fold. Remarkably, the teams remained mostly silent. Eccleston's intricate financial formulas, dividing the proceeds between himself and the teams based on factors like longevity and previous season performance, had made the teams considerably wealthy. However, the lion's share often went to Eccleston himself, who managed to amass at least £3 billion from the sport over a 15-year period. This man was toying with a whole sport. In 2001, EMTV would encounter some difficulties. The Kirk Group seized the opportunity, purchasing 50% of speed investments for $586 million and exercising an option to acquire an additional 25% from Eccleston for $987.5 million. But whilst he may sound a little evil to you right now, I promise you it wouldn't be entirely wrong. But he did do some very good things for the drivers. Take safety, for example. He understood the dangers of the sport. Having managed the late Stuart Lewis Evans and Jochen Rindt, his unwavering commitment ushered in significant advancements, including the implementation of safer barriers, enhanced cockpit protection, and stringent safety regulations. Many drivers owe their lives to Bernie, a fond moniker bestowed upon him by the F1 fraternity, for the safety measures implemented during the sport's formative years. His contributions played a pivotal role in transforming Formula One into a much safer and more secure environment for its daring protagonists. When Liberty took over, Bernie Eccleston was removed from his role as CEO of Formula One management, and in less than a year, the sport underwent a visual overhaul, introducing a new logo, TV graphics, fonts, an updated audio signature for team radio clips, and even a newly composed theme song. The rebrand not only affected Formula One, but also extended to Formula Two and Formula Three. One significant change after Eccleston Zero was Formula One embracing social media. Eccleston's departure marked the new era, as the sport began using platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The change in approach is evident in the remarkable growth of F1's YouTube subscribers, surging from just over 272,000 to near 10 million in six years. Bernie Eccleston's legacy in Formula One was undoubtedly built on lucrative television broadcasting contracts, where networks worldwide paid millions to showcase the racing series to their audiences. This strategy worked for years, but as the internet and broadband technology rapidly advanced, Bernie couldn't keep up. 
Fans wanted more, and they wanted it instantly. They wanted to watch the sport on their computers, tablets, and smartphones. And so, F1 TV was introduced just over a year after Eccleston's departure. This marked a groundbreaking shift. For the first time, fans in select markets like the United States, Germany, and France could subscribe to F1 TV, streaming live sessions directly from the source. One of the most remarkable developments in the post Eccleston era is Formula One's collaboration with Netflix for the series Drive to survive. Yeah, yeah, I know, you don't like it. They sensationalize stuff. They manipulate. A lot of drivers hate it, but Liberty got what they wanted with it. This concept, allowing television cameras unprecedented across the teams and drivers in the paddock throughout a Grand Prix season was inconceivable just five years ago. Despite its imperfections, Drive to Survive has not only engaged existing fans, but also introduced newcomers to the sport of Formula One. Everyone was now closer to the sport than ever before. Although initially met with skepticism, Drive to Survive has become one of the most effective marketing tools for Formula One, creating a connection between the audience and the drivers as individuals and competitors. Mercedes and Ferrari, initially hesitant, eventually embraced the show from its second season. Now, Bernie may have been a little annoyed with this, considering his competitive nature, but we can't ignore that F1 is now perhaps in better health than it has ever been. And Bernie certainly had a hand in that. In under a decade, he went from having millions to becoming a billionaire twice over, selling the rights three times along the way. This was a man who transformed Formula One management into the powerhouse it is today. Imagine controlling everything from TV broadcasts to VIP passes, the travel agency for F1 and even the rules that govern the sport. F1 went from just another sport to one of the most valuable brands in the world. Thanks to his relentless drive, Formula One became a symbol of professionalism. From the stars of F1 to grassroots karting, Bernie's influence reached every level of the racing world. The impressive spectacle Bernie created with the help of his friends could face challenges or undergo a painful transformation, but Bernie Eccleston's legacy will rightly be remembered as one that changed F1 and the entire motorsport landscape, mostly for the better. Speaking of legacies, there have been quite a few events that have shaped Formula One like no other. After all, there was one where McLaren were caught spying on Ferrari and disqualified from the sport. Sports.